that was only sincere. Uh, this is, I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and I will tell you why. Uh, I, I, I live in Indiana. Um, it's, really? Okay. And um, I, I, I love being uh, from Indiana, I, and I think everybody loves their hometown, right? You love where you're from. You love where you're from. You're from Little Rock. You still love it, right? Right? Not so much. Okay. But your hometown is special to you, and I would not leave the Midwest for anything except to move to a town right here in Arkansas that I just found a couple of weeks ago. Um, I would leave for this. The name of the town is spelled F-L-I-P-P-I-N. I should be from there. Because everything at that point would be a joke. Hey, I'm John, and I'm from Flippin' Arkansas. My brother's a flippin' cop on the police force. Every Sunday, my family and I are at the Flippin' Church of Christ, front row. Graduated from Flippin' High School, got the Flippin' Diploma right on my wall. Go birds. <laughs> well, what would, they, I'm just assuming, what would they be called? I don't know. I get, hand out those giant foam hands at football games, there'd be problems, wouldn't there? Christian people, we are the ones, we should set the bar, show the rest of the world how to laugh and have a good time. Don't you agree with that? Because everything that happens to us in the scope of eternity is a joke anyway, you know? When we get to heaven, none of this stuff is going to matter. Stuff we get worried about. If you're a doctor down here on earth, there's no sickness, there's no disease in heaven. So, <laughs> right? if you're a lawyer down here on earth, you probably won't get to heaven. <laughs> it's too early to start judging. <laughs> you know, God made funny stuff everywhere. He built it into creation. Are we supposed to laugh? Yes. He made things to laugh at everywhere. He made West Virginia. <laughs> Come on, those people are not here. I was driving in West Virginia recently. There was a sign next to the road. Right next to the road had a picture of a cell phone on it with a red circle around it and a line through it. And it said, report distracted drivers. <laughs> Underneath that, there was a telephone number. <laughs> We've got to come and get this guy. He's talking on his cell phone. There's two of us. <laughs> I get this question from Christian people when they do shows in churches. Christian people will ask, do you think God has a sense of humor? What do you think? Do you think God has a sense of humor? Hmm? Like, he made you, didn't he? <laughs> Heaven just, all you gotta do is open your eyes, look around. You can tell that God has a sense of humor by the way he made us. I mean, we don't have to be the way we are, but we're hilarious. We sneeze, it's fantastic. I think it falls into like three categories, three major categories. There's people uh, like me, and you always know when the sneeze is coming because there's this big buildup, and I'm like, <laughs> and then it's gone. It just disappears. <laughs> I can't remember my middle name. But then I've got a friend, a friend of mine, and there's no warning when he sneezes. You're in the middle of a conversation and yeah! Gosh. And then my sister, Bonnie, and it's usually women, it's usually girls that do this. When my sister sneezes, there's this big buildup. She goes, ah, ah. be good for you, ladies. You can't have ah without chew. That has to go somewhere. It's going to wind up on your thighs. That's not cellulite. That's unreleased chew right there. Just stacking up. You ever, have you ever uh, done this on a Sunday morning? You don't have time for church. Or you don't have time for, uh, for church. You don't have time for other stuff to do. You don't have time for for breakfast, and you're on your way out to church, dash out the door, 
um, settle down in your seat. It's dead quiet in the room. Minister gets up to preach, and you're going. I think that's the Holy Spirit moving. Have you ever done this any other place where you have to be quiet? Or maybe at church or during a test in the classroom? You ever choke on your own spit? Farts are funny. I know, in every group, somebody goes, no, they're not. And with all due respect, you are wrong. They're proof that God has a sense of humor. They're divinely funny. They're like the perfect universal punchline. They require no setup. You don't have to speak the language. And no matter how many times you've heard it before, you will still laugh. Right? I picture God up in heaven after he made man. He's pretty proud of himself. He brings the angels over. Hey, come here. Look at this. I made this. It's man. <laughs> now, the way I designed his digestive system to work, it builds up gas. It has to come out. Rather than have it be released through his pores like I did with the plants, check this out. smell I know I thought that up too that is so deaf people can appreciate them I mean Jesus went around with 12 fishermen fishermen ladies and gentlemen you think they were sitting around campfires oh excuse me no James and John were called the sons of thunder This is exactly what church is supposed to be like. I mean, every Sunday, this, is, this is what it's supposed to be like. If you're not having fun in church, you're doing it wrong. You're not paying attention. Because you can have fun in church. You should. There's a million ways to have fun in church. <laughs> you can have fun in church just drinking apple juice if you put it in a Budweiser bottle first. <laughs> Share it with all the kids in the nursery. Here you go. And uh, next time they pass the offering plate down your aisle, take a little squirt of whipped cream and <laughs> put that in there. You're welcome. And I got this a little while back. This is my favorite uh, thing. It's an electronic cigarette, just a battery. No fire, no smoke, no nicotine, just a vapor. But check this out. This thing is a blast in the front row of church on Sunday morning. Preach it. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing intrinsic. There's nothing really wrong with if we're gonna say, if we're gonna say that God made everything, Christians. That means He made everything, right? Including tobacco and alcohol. He's not standing up in heaven, looking down, going, "Look what they're doing with grapes." <laughs> I never saw that coming. And people say, like, cigarettes are like hamsters. They're perfectly harmless until you put one in your mouth and light it on fire. <laughs> there's, just, there's just certain places where you don't expect to see a cigarette, right? <laughs> Do you take this man to be your lawful wedded husband? <laughs> Welcome to Vacation Bible School, boys and girls. <laughs> I 
It's a boy. <laughs> it may have been a little too far, right? <laughs> I know it's an imaginary baby, but still. It's not right. You think God has a sense of humor? Oh, I don't know. Let's look at stuff. Of course he does, and he expects us to use it. You know, he made Christian people. <laughs> We're hilarious. We say stuff. It's funny. We say stuff like, we're just here to introduce people to Jesus. We just want to introduce people to Jesus. It's backwards. Jesus already knows everybody, doesn't he? He's going to be like, yeah, I know how many hairs you have on your head, but I'm not good with names. Or that visitor sticker. That'll help me out a lot. It's for Jesus. He gave us each other, too. And th this is the message, you know, that we need to understand, that God has a sense of humor, and he has built laughter into all of us. You know, there are funny things about all of us. Just embrace it. Don't fight it. Embrace it. Laughter is a blessing. You parents, you mothers, mothers, your kids are going to laugh at you. They will. Kids, make noise if you think your mom is crazy. See, I believe you. I believe you. Let me let you in know a little inside information. She was sane before she had you. Mothers have to go insane. That's how they survive their children. And so, Mom, don't feel bad when your kids laugh at you. You are blessing them when you talk. My mom blessed us almost every time she opened her mouth when I was growing up. Um, I was up in my room when I was in high school one day. And my room was at the top of the stairs and around the corner. So you couldn't see into my room from the bottom of the stairs. So mom was standing there, the bottom of the stairs, calling up to me. John? Yeah, mom? Are you still here? <laughs> nope, leave a message. My mom was driving my brother and I to school one day. We're nine, eight years old in the backseat of the car. And uh, she's driving along. A squirrel hops out in the road a quarter mile in front of her. And so my mom seizes this opportunity to teach the boys something that's going to be valuable later in life. She goes, oh, there's a squirrel. Boys, pay attention. This is very important. When you get your driver's license, you never swerve to avoid an animal because he's going to get out of my way. just mushed him right into the road. Before we got to school, there was a crossing guard in the intersection. My brother and I were going, move! I said, my mom, I love her. I love my mom. And she had all these phrases that she would use over and over again. She still uses some of them. Um, classic mom phrases, uh, like if there, was, if there was more than one way to accomplish a task, a couple of ways to do something, my mom would say this, well, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> oh. Mom, how do you know that? <laughs> if mom didn't want to stand out late, like at a party or something, she would say this, I don't want you staying out till the last dog is hung. I'm going to come home after they hang the first dog. <laughs> what kind of party is that? Here, boy. <laughs> she also didn't want to stay out till the cows came home. She would say, I don't just stay out till the cows come home. Mom, I've lived here my whole life. Cows have never come home. I don't think they know they live here. They probably saw what you did to the dog. out of here. My mom would tell us about snakes every time we lost something. Couldn't find a sweater. My mom would come in and find it. She'd throw it at me. It's right there. Your sweater. If it had been a snake, it'd have bit you. <laughs> if it had been a snake, I wouldn't have been looking for it. <laughs> if it had been a panther, it would have bit me too. That's the reason nobody ever loses panthers. <laughs> mom, I can't find my panther. <laughs> We used to make my mom so mad. We used to make my mom so bad, so mad she could spit. She would say, you boys make me so mad I could spit. 
wear your brand spanking news out. <laughs> she also gets so mad she couldn't see straight. You boys, I'm so mad I can't see straight. I'm over here, mom. You see what I mean? <laughs> love my mom. We all do goofy things. Um, I order things from infomercials. I said it. I don't care. I'll be the first. Yeah, I, I do. I order things. And some of you have done this, too. Some of you ladies have done this. You bought this particular item for a man in your life, and you did it with the best of intentions. You did it to demonstrate that you care about him, that you love him. So you bought him a Snuggie. I will say this on behalf of the man in your life. He didn't want it. No matter how he acted, no man wants a Snuggie. Partially because it's called a Snuggie. And now they have camouflage Snuggies. Have you seen those? Who in the world are those for? The guy in the duck blind? Hand me my shotgun and my Snuggie. The reason that I bought the Snuggie was because of the half hour infomercial that they used to advertise it. Have you seen it? I taped it, it's glorious. They have a, a couch, and there's a lady sitting on one end of the couch, and uh, she's trying to cover up with this blanket, and the phone starts ringing at the other end of the couch, so she's trying to uh, get the phone and cover up the blanket at the same time, and the voice goes, are you tired of struggling with those blankets? If you are having trouble operating a blanket, you are going to get that Snuggie on backwards. Hey, this is a robe! I got ripped off! Good thing I saved the receipt. I bought our last vacuum cleaner from an infomercial. I did it. I didn't mean to, but it said, order now. So I'm like, okay. And it's the world's most powerful vacuum cleaner. How do I know that? It said so on the infomercial. And uh, it was mesmerizing. I'm up at 3 o'clock in the morning because that's when really good infomercials are on. And I'm glued to the television set watching this infomercial. And they got this vacuum cleaner. They're running it all over the studio. And the voice is going, this is the world's most powerful vacuum cleaner. Look at the job it's doing on these quarters. A stack of quarters. They're just sucking them up. Ding, 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 ding. And I'm at home going, yes. Yes, we've got so much money laying around on the carpeting. We have no idea how to get cash out of the shag. They picked up a bowling ball with a I've been using those three holes in the top of mine. <laughs> totally unnecessary. And have you noticed no matter how powerful your vacuum cleaner is, there's always that one little piece of white fuzz on the carpet. You're using it, you're like in a quarter, I'd have got it. Yeah. <laughs> Money on the carpet. Our vacuum cleaner has a, a light on the front of it, too. A headlight. <laughs> in front of our vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Are there people in the universe that go, when the sun goes down, <laughs> we vacuum. <laughs> Thank you.
That's <laughs> My wife explained it to me. She goes, no, it's because, it's because there's dirt in the corner that you can't see without a light. You can't see it. Then why are we vacuuming it? <laughs> we all do things. We all do goofy things. Um, embrace it. And, and it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere if you just open your eyes. They have, uh, I like to watch golf on, on television. Anybody else golf? Yeah. <laughs> Four. This will be great. This is going to rock. Uh, I, I watch golf because it is excellent to fall asleep to. You, you tune into golf and you lay down on the couch and it is, just, it is better than Bob Ross. On t- you know who Bob Ross is? I mean, the, the guy on PBS, the painter with the hair? That dude is the best cure for insomnia because he's, he's got the painting up there. He's real good, but he's, it's the way he talks. It's, oh, he dropped that little happy tree right in there. Just drop that little happy tree. Maybe there's a little bush that lives right down here. It's your world. It's your world. Whatever you want. It's your world. Get a little titanium brown. Slide that up onto the mountain right there. Right there. It's your world. I have no idea how he ever finished a painting. I think that's your world. But golf, the, uh, the other reason that I like to watch golf is because I think the golf industry is feeling pressure from the other sports industries to compete with them, uh, with their technology. Because the other sports have got all this technology, the high-tech stuff, and I think golf is trying to use it. For example, they have slow motion instant replay in golf. <laughs> they have slow motion instant replay in golf. Oh, he missed that putt by just a couple of feet. Let's see that again. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of necessarily playing golf because I'm terrible at it. Um, I don't know if we've got any good, good golfers here, people that are good at it. Um, Yeah, I don't expect you to answer. Um, (laughs) This is not a DVD yet. You know that? That I can actually see you. (laughs) And I have feelings. Golf is... uh, I'm not good at it. You know how you're supposed to go into the pro shop ahead of a game of golf and buy all of your equipment, balls and tees and stuff like that? Well, the guy in the pro shop recognizes me. So when he sees me coming, he goes and sits in back of the golf cart so he can sell me stuff as I go from hole to hole. And every tee, and I'm like... Sploosh. Great. Can I get another five iron? Thanks. Well, you guys aren't golfers, are you? That was... It's a club. <laughs> the part about golf I do like is a handicap. That's a great idea, because a handicap allows good golfers and bad golfers to play together and compete fairly. I think there should be a handicap in all of life. <laughs> Social handicap on men that are too tall, too good looking, or make too much money so I can compete with them. Like, guys like that shouldn't be able to drive any car they want. That's not fair. They should have to walk into the dealership, and the dealer would say, how tall are you? 6'2", blue eyes, sandy brown hair, cleft in chin. I'm sorry, sir, with handicap, best I can put you in is a 78 Vega. make it fair <laughs> yeah that's that's part of the reason I like bowling too is compared to golf you know, because bowling you got to be a really bad bowler to lose equipment like you do in golf <laughs> oh did anybody see where that went 
seventh frame, that's three balls I've lost already. <laughs> It's, what, what I'm saying, what my, my message is that everybody has something that's funny about them. Everybody has something that they have failed um, at. There's, there's failures, there's shortcomings in all of us. Don't let that bug you. Don't let that get you down, you know, because, because we all have them. So don't make excuses for them either, you know. And we live in a culture now where we make excuses for, for bad behavior. You know, we, we say things like, well, I haven't had my first cup of coffee yet this morning. Does anybody work with a person like that who's like a homicidal maniac when they come in, but it's okay because they haven't had their coffee? They're like, don't even talk to me. I haven't had my coffee yet this morning. It's not been a good day. I've already, I have already shoved an old woman down the stairs in my apartments. I am a powder keg. Back off and stop blinking. You're giving me a headache. I haven't had my coffee yet this morning. That's not going to hold up in court. How do you plead? Decaffeinated. <laughs> Just embrace it. There are things about us that we, that we need to change. There's things about us that are going to be shortcomings. Um, recently, I was on stage, and I got in trouble because I made a comment um, about uh, animals. And the comment, I'll tell you what the comment was, and, uh, and I'll tell you why I made the comment first, which is I was trying to, I was trying to say that people are, uh, are more important um, than animals because people are made in the image of God, and, and therefore, you know, we, have a, we are of more value than animals. And so I said basically that. I said that I believe that people are better than animals. And I got a lot of, of, of folks in the audience that were upset with me, and they, and they wrote me angry letters. And I didn't understand that because when I said that, when I said that people are better than animals, everybody in the audience was people. <laughs> you know, and if there had been animals in the audience, they wouldn't have cared. You know, I can get right in my dog's face and say, you're an idiot. I'm better than you. And he's... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just that people, you know, people... Well, look at, look at how, how clearly we have dominated the planet. I mean, there's no other animal. There's no other life form that's even close in second. And if we didn't do it, who would? You know, dogs? <laughs> Please. You can't dominate a planet if you spend 90% of your time sniffing things to figure out where to pee. <laughs> It's not good use of your time. <laughs> so it's us, you know, and I got into trouble, and I, and I didn't mean to get in trouble, because basically what I'm saying is the same thing I'm trying to say now, is that people have value. Even though we're goofy, and even though we've got idiosyncrasies, and we, and we make mistakes, you know, we all have, have value, and it's a bigger value than the animals have, and we put commercials on television for dog food, and, and they actually say, there's actually a little chart for the dog food where they'll put a little sprig of parsley next to it. Have you seen that where they put the dog food down and put a little parsley next to it? And there's a little chart that says, this dog food tastes 30% better than this dog food. And I'm like, does that matter? I mean, this is an animal that drinks out of the toilet. How, how discerning is his palate? I mean, what could you do to dog food so that he wouldn't eat it? I mean... The dog's never going to come in and go, whoa, I'm, I'm not going to eat that. I'm going to go see what's in the cat box. <laughs> but animals make people happy, you know, so that's their, that's their function. But we say things, you know. There's things on television. There's, there's all sorts of statistics. If you keep your eyes open, you can find stuff to laugh about. God has built it into creation. Made funny stuff everywhere. You've seen the commercial where it says four out of five dentists recommend sugarless gum for their patients. Four out of five dentists. You know what that means? That means one out of five dentists understands how to run a successful practice. <laughs> I mean, I, I would love to sit down with that dentist and get some feedback from him as what he tells you. You know, you know, flossing, you don't have to do that every single day. That's... Fluoride, it's overrated. I imagine he probably lives in a neighborhood with all the other dentists, the other four dentists, and he backs his Mercedes out of the driveway in front of his mansion, rolls down the street, hey, should have recommended milk duds. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's funny things about, about all of us, all of us, parents, people, Christians, all of us have got funny things that we do, so just embrace it, and don't use that as an excuse to, to be down on yourself, because um, we've all got things that we, that we do that are... They're us. You know, we all have a purpose uh, in life. And uh, nothing has brought that to my attention more than uh, the monster truck rally. 
That's why I heard the voice of God at the monster truck rally. Amen? Okay, I thought there'd be more here. Um, how do you know when the monster truck rally's coming to town? How do you know when it's here? Because you hear that voice on the radio, right? It's that voice on, on the uh, commercial, same voice all over the nation for every monster truck rally. A couple of weeks before it comes, you turn it on. Mm, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at the Coliseum. It's monster truck mayhem. There's no resisting the urge that's persistent to get your fix of heavy metal twisting. In this car, crushing adrenaline, rushing fuel, gushing extravaganza. Don't be snoozing or you'll be losing and you'll miss this two-fisted spark spewing blast of palooza. There's engine fires and smoking tires and all the destruction your heart desires in the flashing, this crashing, this smashing, this celebration in the galaxy this Sunday at the Coliseum. <laughs> And that dude is perfect for the monster truck rally. He's perfect. That's exactly the guy you want. But you don't want that guy doing story time at the library on Sunday. <laughs> I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam. I am. <laughs> I don't want to read. That guy should be a different voice, like a lilting English accent would be good for that. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam. I am too. <laughs> but that's not the guy you want doing monster truck commercials on the radio. This Sunday at the Coliseum, there's going to be t trucks. <laughs> Things are going to smoke and catch on fire. It's going to be quite a lock. <laughs> No, it's a different guy for that. And that's you and me. You know, we've all got a purpose. We've all got a voice. We've got a, a, a thing that we're supposed to do. And it's different for each one of us. Some of you guys are monster truck guys. And some of you guys are story time guys. And some of you guys are girls. <laughs> Principle's the same, you know? So don't get down on yourself. And also don't use that as an excuse to, uh, to let yourself off the hook for bad behavior because we all have bad things that we do and you need to change those you know you need to, to grow a little bit we've got a, there's a song on the radio now in the culture that, that says you're on the right track because you were born this way there's nothing wrong with you you were born this way you're on the right track this is the way you were born you got nothing to apologize for you were born this way mm -mm 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 -mm. Mm -mm. none of us were born potty trained right I mean, I was, I was born with an umbilical cord right there. They snipped that puppy off in seconds. Five years later, I'd have been going, slow down, mom! <laughs> and that would be weird, wouldn't it? I mean, you couldn't live like that. You're supposed to grow up. You're not supposed to stay the way you're born. You're supposed to grow up. That's the natural thing to do, because babies don't know anything. You know, they're idiots. <laughs> they are, but they're going to grow up, I hope. Um, you know, I've got a one-year-old granddaughter um, back home, and we go over to visit Cammie, and her, her mother says, give Papa a kiss. This is how Cammie kisses at one-year-old. <laughs> and I think she's going to, I hope she's going to outgrow that, because I don't want to be standing in her wedding line reception. <laughs> And here's another thing. We've got uh, at a church a couple of weeks ago, this happened. We're sitting in, in rows. Um, I don't know why I feel like I have to demonstrate. <laughs> the row. It's like a line. Like you're not going to follow that row. Okay. It's a row. And I'm sitting in, in the row. And, and in front of me, there's a young couple with a small baby girl, nine, ten months old maybe. And the mother has got her on her lap, so the girl is looking over mom's shoulder at me, sitting behind her. If you've got babies in church, don't do that, because babies never break eye contact. <laughs> I had to poke her in the eye. I just... It's mom's fault. It wasn't my fault. And so in keeping with that idea and trying to do that, I'm, I also am trying to grow up. I'm trying to continue to, to expand and, uh, and grow. And, and I'm working on my vocabulary. And 
Um, so I'm reading the classics, American classics, English classics. And I started with, uh, you know, Robert Louis Stevenson's swashbuckling tale, Treasure Island, tale of adventure. And uh, I'm five pages into Treasure Island and I'm going, wow, this is really hard to understand. <laughs> Why is that? Because it's in English, and I sort of speak that language, <laughs> kind of. Why am I struggling? Well, I looked it up, and Shakespeare, who wrote even before that, wrote in the 1600s, had an active vocabulary of 54,000 words, 54,000. Today, you and me, us, in the United States, have an active vocabulary of 3,000 words. That's why when we read Shakespeare, we're like, what light through yonder? <laughs> yonder. Just put in a DVD. <laughs> Let's go to the monster truck rally. We're just done with this. And it kind of made me feel bad because I presume that children, little kids probably in the 1600s have a bigger vocabulary than I have now. Which means I wouldn't be able to read fairy tales to children in the 1600s because I'm not smart enough and they would be bigger. They'd have been like, uh, <clears throat> In time past, though not long ago, there lived pigs in stature little, and number three, who, being of an age, both entitled and inspired to seek their fortune, did set about to do thusly. When they had traveled a distance, pig number first spake, saying, Hearken, brethren, heed this tempestuous realm. Tarry we long from hearth and home. We shall fare, I fear, not well. <laughs> and so, being collectively agreed but individually impelled, the diminutive swine set about each to erect for himself an abode. Pig number one did construct his house from straw. Pig number two did likewise, though rather not from straw, instead from sticks. Meanwhile, unique in his imaginings, pig number three did erect as his domicile, stalwart and garish, a structure made from brick entirely. Ah, but soon there happened along, as is frequently the scenario in classic tale of protagonist pig or red-hooded child. A wolf. Carnivorous nature in full season, he called out to the straw ensconced swine, saying, Pray thee, little pig, grant me entrance. But pig one recalled with sage foreboding that he is mad who trusts in the tameness of a belly pinched wolf and responded immediately, Nay, it shall not be, indeed, not by wit or whisker jowl. <laughs> To this most expected response, the wolf replied immediately, Then steal thyself, little pig. Forthwith shall I endeavor, employing means both huffing and puffing, to dismantle yon flaxen fortress. <laughs> Whereupon there issued forth from the wolf an exhale of gale proportions <laughs> that quickly rendered straw hovel to dregs and dross and carried aloft piglet and shattered quarters both. Exposed now to claw and fang, Piglet One made haste, Wolf in pursuit to the stick festoon sanctum of Peccary Secondary. <laughs> Causing Pig Two to cry out in dismay, Well, this knocks my knickers! <laughs> Marshalling of feral wolf to my doorstep is nowhere among those endeavors amenable or congenial. A thousand pardons, begged one. It would seem the beast's baneful breath has purged me of home and sound judgment alike. <laughs> the malevolent blast of the wolf's exhale splattered second swine's shack and shortened his sanctimonious scolding simultaneously. <laughs> Lo and behold, squealed too, stand we now amid wooden wreckage, tremulous and vulnerable with nary a strategy for eschewing the canine devourer looming in deadly proximity. <laughs> strategy, exclaimed one, while tis noble to contemplate tactical particularities, pressed as we are with a time restraint forbidding detailed strategical conversations, I would urge we run. <laughs> 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 
whether by their own fleet-footed competence or the wolf's windless attitude, the bantam porkers arrived at their ultimate kindred neighbor's inexpugnable brick ingress unscathed. Upon the third pig's door, with urgent hooves, they pounded, calling out, Unbar this entrance, and with haste we beseech thee! The third pig hailed from the American colonies. and possessing a vocabulary substantially less robust than his impromptu visitors, <laughs> replied, Say what? <laughs> Seek we sanctuary, they implored on the verge of hysteria, lest we fall forthwith to the ravenous appetency of yonder approaching carnivore. Still confounded by their importunate words, Pig 3 did render ajar his portal, whereupon one and two spilled through and collapsed beyond his threshold, enervated. <laughs> so, you all just wanted to come in? <laughs> you could have said that. Sinister hiss of the wolf could be heard again. Pray thee, pigs, grant me entrance. The wolf said one and two. Wolf said three. What do you suppose he wants? <laughs> he seeks to gain purchase within. Indeed, he would occupy this very alcove, where he but afforded the most meager of opportunity. Right. I'm just going to go ask him what he wants. <laughs> Under no circumstances, squeal too, flinging self bodily against portal. There is naught to be gained accosting external opponent, save our own immediate demise. What did you say about my mama? House and occupants were again engulfed in a malevolent blast of wolfish wind. The foundation shook, the frame rattled, and lo, to the astonished eyes of Piglet, an encroaching scoundrel alike, stood the third pig's lodging undaunted. Aghast and befuddled, two queried of three, how does against such relentless and torrential onslaught this domicile endure? Pig three puffed out chest, tapped a hoof, to the hearth and responded, it's American made. God bless you guys, thanks a lot.